And hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest in the Innovation at Work webinar series from MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, this is the continuation uh, of our short uh, format that we introduced earlier this year. Just a quick 30 minutes uh, out of your day in which we hope to bring you the latest insights uh, from MIT Sloan and our faculty, uh, in particular ones that uh, are valuable to us as we're all grappling with the challenges uh, that we've been experiencing over the past several months, as well as the more fundamental and ongoing challenges that we have in our businesses, particularly around driving innovation and change. Today, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Dr. Elspeth Johnson, and she's going to uh, tell us about her work on how do we really, and the emphasis on really, deliver strategic change in our organizations. Uh, and Elspeth, uh, as you can see, as a really uh, fascinating combination of experiences from the private sector, the public sector, and then education. Uh, and she works at very high levels with a, a, a lot of uh, significant companies on very challenging change uh, initiatives and how to actually make things happen. So we're really looking forward to uh, hearing about that work uh, from Elspeth, who also teaches, of course, in our executive education programs. And she summed up a lot of this uh, uh, experience in her, her recent book, Step Up, Step Back, How to Really Deliver Strategic Change in Your Organization. Uh, and we'll certainly uh, tell you how to get a copy of that uh, later if you're interested in it. Uh, also, as we're going, please do, as Paola said, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, I will uh, be monitoring those. And uh, after Elspeth has made a few opening remarks, uh, we'll have a conversation and have a chance to uh, introduce some of your uh, questions and ask the things that are on, on your minds. So with that, I would uh, like to hand over to Elspeth. Welcome uh, to the webinar series, Elspeth. And uh, Thank you. Please take it from here. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I think as we outlined in the, um, the advert for this um, half an hour webinar, this is really what we're going to try and cover today. Um, the first two of these points, so why is it that delivering strategic change always seems to be harder than, than possibly it needs to be? Um, I think we can answer that quite easily be, by, by simply saying that actually the research tells us that leaders aren't really delivering what managers need. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think one of the things that very often I, I see in leaders is that they are quite attached to what I've come to describe as the Hollywood version of leadership. In other words, that um, a business uh, is in trouble, it needs a turnaround, uh, this new, invariably from outside the organization, this new, pretty charismatic leader comes in tasked with a transformational change. Um, and through a mixture of personality and charisma and persistence and almost sheer will, uh, moves the organization to a place where it's um, you know, set up for success. Um, wh whilst there is some cases of that happening, um, actually uh, what, what's a much more prevalent um, type of change is, is a lot more boring, a lot less kind of exciting and dramatic than this Hollywood version of leadership would suggest. And so actually it's, it's when leaders kind of embrace the boring and, and, and really pay attention to the mundane that actually they, um, they can actually, you know, focus on the, the parts of change that managers really need. So how do we know that? Well, we know that because this research that I'm going to talk about today is different from what's already out there. And it's different really for three reasons. Um, first of all, it asked different people. So it asked managers what they needed from leaders rather than asking leaders simply what they did. Uh, we asked them, th those managers, different questions. So we particularly focused on questions around how and why did things happen um, rather than simply what, what happened or what was delivered. Um, it's what we call in, um, in the research a, a, a process study rather than simply a, an event study. So we asked different people different questions, but also over a different time period. Uh, an awful lot of, would you believe it, strategic long-term change is actually only researched uh, right at the start of the change. So the kind of kickoff process the first year. What we looked at was um, the change from start to finish. And actually this change took three and a half years. So it was studied over a much longer time frame. 
by asking different people different questions over a different time frame, we were able to unearth uh, a, a story that is quite different, particularly in some ways. And so what we call this is inductive research. In other words, we, we don't approach our informants with a hypothesis or, or our own views of, of why something happens. We, we really are shaped by what they tell us. Um, and so what resulted from that research is what we call the step up, step back model. And so uh, what I'm gonna spend the next kind of 10 minutes talking about is really what that model looks like, what are the headline uh, pieces of advice from that model? And also, what are the biggest watch outs for leaders? Uh, what from both the experience from the research and also my own experience of working with people to put the step up, step back model into practice, what, kind, what, what, what parts of the model and what types of behavior are most likely to trip leaders up and why. So hopefully that will give you a, a bit of a, a sense of what this model is and why it's different. So this really is uh, an overview of the model. Um, you'll see that the X axis is measured in months and that's the, the full three and a half years, 42 months of the change because guess what? Long-term strategic change, clues in the name, is a marathon rather than a sprint. Um, but essentially what this model tells us is that what managers really need from leaders is for leaders to step up and actually do more than they typically do in the early stages of a change in two specific ways and at specific times. And then from year two onwards, leaders need to step back and give managers two things, focus and consistency. Um, if they do those things, then this wonderful thing happens, you know, almost at kind of the end of year two going into year three, which is that managers start experiencing this thing that we call meaningful autonomy. In other words, the autonomy that they have, the decision rights that they have been given, um, are, are, are suddenly things that they feel both able um, and comfortable to exercise. In other words, it doesn't feel like it's a, it requires the assumption of personal risk for them as a manager to, um, to take a decision. They're not having to go out on a limb to decide what should be worked on or what their team should, should focus on. So let me, um, let me spend a little bit more time double clicking on these two step up dimensions of the model. In other words, what you need to get right in the first year. Well, the first one, actually, you need to get right really by the end of the first three months. Now, let me say this, of course, is a, um, a model that involves human beings. And so whenever we have um, human beings involved in an endeavor, be it long term change or anything else, uh, a family, a business, a, a society, human beings aren't completely programmable. Um, I think there's sometimes we wish that they were, but they're not. And so it's gonna be up to the leader to judge when the, each of these dimensions has been delivered. So maybe clarity you need to deliver for your super skeptical audience by two months, or maybe they'll give you a bit of leeway and you can take the first four months of the change. But on the whole, you need to deliver clarity by the end of the first three months. Now, let me tell you what clarity um, really requires. I mean, it, it says there, communicate what you want. And essentially, there's three elements to that very, very quickly. Um, and I have to say that in the, the program that Peter mentioned, we, we go into this in a lot more detail. But the headline is that leaders need to talk about why the change is needed and why now. They need to talk about what will, what will um, result in the change. In other words, what outcome is being targeted and by when. And ideally that outcome exists at a P&L level. So it's a big macro target. Um, and also they need to talk about how people ought to behave, whether with their customers or with each other, in order to deliver the, the, the outcomes that they have, have specified. So that's essentially what clarity looks like. And weirdly, because it, it sounds very 
kind of easy when you when you first say well you know leaders ought to communicate what they want weirdly this is actually where a lead a lot of leaders seem to go wrong right in the first step which is that they're not sufficiently clear with their organization about why the change is needed what it will produce and how people need to behave but assuming they've delivered clarity they then need to align the business around the change that they have uh, asked for and there's four sources of alignment um, there's what leaders say so that the ordinary routine conversations that you know when you meet them in the lift what are they talking about when you meet them for coffee what are they agitating for so are they really still talking about the change and again you can start that right at the beginning so in parallel with the work on clarity it so but in term it's not just what you say of course it's also what you do so what are you role modeling? Are you role modeling the behaviors you've asked for? Are you giving the change your time? Have you devoted part of your diary and your calendar to the change that you've asked for so that the people working on it have access to you if they need it? But in addition to what leaders can do um, almost as agents of the change, there's two other sources of alignment and they are much more structural and they are alignment by resourcing. Uh, which means budget, but it also means people, getting the right people on the change. And the fourth and final source of alignment is alignment by KPIs or metrics, changing the KPIs by which we measure, incentivize, and reward people in the business to, uh, to fit the new strategy that's been asked for. So those are the, the first two dimensions of the model very much the stepping up stage and then stepping back means that you give it you you first of all allow managers to focus on it essentially that means that managers can't be too overloaded you they've got to have some slack and um, so they need time at a personal level but leaders also need to give the change the time it needs because again clues in the name it's a long-term endeavor and so if leaders are expecting that this will produce a result too soon um, then typically leaders will prematurely um, curtail the change before it's actually started to deliver so that's the first um, thing that, that leaders need dimension that leaders need to start putting in place um, at the start of year two the second one is consistency um, and I, I just, you know, the advice there is very clear. Leave it alone. Um, and we'll say a little bit more about that on the next slide, because in, in many ways, I think this is the one that leaders uh, actually have most difficulty with. So if that's an overview of the model, let me take you through some specific bits of what I think is almost the kind of most important advice from this new framework. And if you like, it's almost the mirror image of my experience of where leaders most commonly trip up so the first bit of advice and to some extent we've talked about this a little bit is to step up do more than you otherwise would at the very start of the change by agreeing and very clearly communicating the target outcome of this new straight new change or this new strategy and that's critical because people need to know really clearly what you're asking them to deliver uh, the, the, the sequence of that is you clarify outcomes first and then behaviors. And the reason that that's an important sequence is, in my experience, a lot of organizations, they, they, you know, they might have read an HBR article or they've picked up a book in a, in a, you know, on, a, on a business trip. And it might rec you know, recommend that every organization becomes more collaborative um, or better at networking. In other words, leaders choose to change the behaviors or the culture in their organization almost independently of the outcomes they're targeting and and so this is the critical link you you can only specify the behaviors you need once you've clarified the outcomes because it's you choose the behaviors that are in service of the outcomes that you want and then once you've got both of those clarified you can then choose activities actually though it's not leaders who ought to be choosing activities, it's actually the managers. So this starts up to set up the split, the demarcation between the work of leadership, which is to, to be clear and prescriptive about outcomes and behaviors, versus the work of managers. The managers who are closer to the market, um, who may well know um, more about what customers prefer and how those preferences are changing. They may also know much more kind of in depth 
the the kind of the black box of the of the operations of the business so they are they really are the people best placed to decide on what work streams need to be prioritized in order to deliver the outcomes that that leaders have asked for so that's the first critical part of this this clarity but but notice the, the part that's after the semicolon there, over a long enough period. And so the, the, the reason this is very important, um, and again, I, I think it's interesting that I almost took this for granted at the start of the research because I was researching long-term change. Now you would think that people would kind of get a sense from that description that this was an inherently long-term endeavor, but actually, Impatient leaders can can very often um, think that um, that you know progress ought to be made faster than is realistic. And the reason why it's not realistic to expect fast progress here is that we're talking about strategic change. And strategic change means you need to make deep, fundamental changes either to what the business does or the way in which it does it. And that means that you are absolutely in the territory of a j-curve so um, a j-curve i'm sure many of you are familiar with it's probably the bane of your life um, it is this idea that um, as one of my colleagues at mit often says things are probably going to get worse before they get better in other words uh, in order to benefit from the investment that you make in the j-curve you actually need an x-axis the, the measurement of time that is long enough um, in order for you to capitalize on the investment um, that you've made. And so being realistic that if a J-curve is involved, the outcomes that you're targeting need to be given long enough to emerge is I think really important. And leaders really need to get their heads around that and communicate to people that this is a long-term endeavor. Um, the, the second part I think is always worth calling out um, and again, it really pertains to the stepping up part so that the, the work of the first 12 months of a long term change is that quick wins are not going to be enough. Quick wins might be required for motivational or political reasons. It's always really helpful to see that you're making progress. But actually, fundamental change requires um, progress, not just at a cosmetic level. Um, as one of my informants memorably put it, he said, a lot of the stuff that we were working on, it wasn't quick. And so we just couldn't call it quick wins. It also wasn't glamorous. It wasn't actually the stuff that you kind of really wanted to work on. It was awful, boring work, cleaning up and deduping the customer database, paying down the tech debt that we let accumulate over the first six or seven years that we've been in business. It was, in other words, zero glam work. Um, but, but recognizing that that zero glam work is essential to the change that's being done. And the role of leaders here is, is to recognize that but also to make sure that that work, this zero glam work, is being properly resourced and celebrated. Talk about it, talk about the people who are doing it, because that work is hard, it's grind, um, but it's absolutely critical if you are to, uh, to, to essentially come out the other end of the J-curve that we've just talked about. I think the other thing that's really worth saying, and, and it's amazing to me how few businesses get this get this work um, on KPIs underway in the early stages of a change, they, they think that they can leave this almost to the second year, is you have to change the KPIs and you have to start collecting the right data. Um, and, you know, I think everybody recognizes that if you're introducing a new KPI, it's going to take time to define it, to baseline it, to measure it, and, and you have to have all of that ready before you can introduce it and put, put it in people's um, job descriptions or performance um, appraisals. So people know that that might take you, you know, maybe the best part of that first year, but you need to be telegraphing, signaling that as a leader, you know that this is important and this change is coming. It's something that you as a leader have prioritized the work on and that change is coming. And actually what the research tells us is that people will start to change their behavior and opt for different priorities, even before the KPIs are changed, almost um, in anticipation of the change that they know is coming, provided the leader has been clear that that, that, that is gonna happen. So signaling is really important. 
Let me say one final thing about the stepping back part. And as I say, um, it's partly give it time. So, so don't be impatient because this is a long-term endeavor. But it's also this consistency part. Your, the change that you've started cannot survive you changing your mind, um, introducing a new strategy, even, even changing how you message uh, the importance um, of, of this existing strategy. Um, that all sows potentially the seeds of confusion and potentially conflict within your organization. So don't change your mind and don't tinker with it. Don't add in uh, what one leader calls additional priorities. Um, I mean, that is just a, a lovely oxymoron for, for, for something that the business, this is the last thing the business needs. Uh, now, of course it's legitimate to be looking out the window and thinking to yourself, you know, I wonder if there's an opportunity uh, or a threat um, that, you know, two years ago when we decided on this strategy, we weren't aware of, the market hadn't thrown up at us. Maybe the market's changed, maybe the, the regulation has changed or your customers' preferences have changed. So of course, the external environment is changing. And of course, that means you need to be paying attention, as I say, you know, what, what um, sometimes called looking out the window. It's perfectly legitimate to look out the window and decide that you need a different strategy, in which case, choose a different strategy. But be aware that that means that the, the strategy that you chose two years ago won't now get delivered because you, you're choosing something else to be done instead. And at that point for this new strategy, you, you need to go back and, and start the clarity and alignment and focus and consistency process for this new strategy, just as you, as you went through it for the, for the one that you're now pivoting away from. So don't change your mind and don't tinker with it. And as I say, when I talk to leaders about what they find most difficult, um, I think it's actually that. Um, Actually, most of the leaders I work with are incredibly engaged in their businesses. They work incredibly hard. So the stepping up, I, I think they're intuitively attracted to. They're like, yeah, absolutely, I'm gonna step up. But hang on, wait, this stepping back bit, um, don't you need me for this? Um, is this even work? Um, and, and I think the important thing I would say here is you're stepping back, but not stepping out. So you're stepping away from uh, a lot of the work that hopefully by the first year you've done, the work of clarity and alignment that lays the foundations for you to be able to step back, but you're not stepping out. You, you're still available. You're still an active um, uh, leader of the change. Uh, you're just not changing your mind and you're not tinkering with it. So, um, that's kind of my overview of the model. As I say, some of the headline advice that came out of the research and some ways that in my experience, leaders um, slightly struggle. It's kind of the, the sources of their biggest, um, their biggest angst um, when, when they're trying to do this. So with that, I'm really happy to take questions. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Elspeth. This has been fascinating. We've been getting quite a number of questions. We've got time to address uh, maybe a couple uh, and, and one set seem, uh, not surprisingly, have to do with, given the situation that we're in at the moment uh, and have been for the last several months, you know, a lot of organizations are making strategic, having to make strategic changes that are being imposed on them. And they're having to do it with much more uncertainty and much more agile ways, perhaps, than this uh, long-term strategy might, uh, might, might suggest. So is there anything in your, in your research that uh, can, can help us with advice on uh, on, on that challenge when we need to do things much more quickly, what should we do? Um, weirdly, I've actually just written a paper on this, which is coming out in about um, two or three months time. But to, to kind of answer the question now, rather than have you wait for that, um, I think I would say two things. I think I would say in, in a black swan event, which arguably COVID is, actually the time to, to try and focus on strategy that, you, you know, almost almost leave strategy aside for the emergency kind of black swan reactions that you need to take. You need to take them really quickly. So during such a time, I am really relaxed about clients or, or organizations being really, really tactical. Um, because, you know, particularly, you know, I, I watched a lot of the organizations that I work with through March and April and May, essentially just press the pause button on their long-term strategy 
because they just had to keep the show on the road. They had to keep cash coming in the door. They had to help employees find, you know, find their way to in working in this completely different environment. But, but, but then, and I, and I think almost that time has come, August, September, I'm, I'm sensing that organizations are kind of saying, okay, well, we've kept the show on the road. We are still in business. Actually, now we need to look again at the strategic change that we were thinking about perhaps in Q1. Now, I know a lot of organizations who are, who are recognizing that because COVID is, is unlike SARS-1, um, you know, still, still with us and, and may well be with us for a while, that actually they need to look again at their strategy. Either it needs to go deeper um, perhaps, um, you know, fundamentally making their business more efficient, in other words, laying people off, and maybe those cuts need to go deeper, or the speed with which they've almost been forced to go digital means that actually their platform and their business model can be fundamentally reviewed. So I actually know quite a few clients who are almost opening up the process of thinking again about their strategic change. Uh, what I have to tell you is uh, the advice for how to do strategic change, it's not different in a virtual or um, kind of crisis environment, it's not different, it's just more. So you need to communicate even more about what you want because you don't have the luxury of physical town halls when you can galvanize people with your charisma. Um, so more communication, greater clarity. And I think also people looking for, because again, they can't see you role modeling. Um, they, they can't meet you uh, in the lift. Um, I think more dependence being put on those structural elements of alignment. In other words, by resourcing and by KPIs. So my advice to clients is it's not different, but it is more. And so actually the stepping up part requires even more stepping up from leaders. Great, uh, thank you. And maybe in the in the last sixty seconds, if you had an elevator pitch uh, to leaders who are, who are really struggling with the issue of, we know this is a long term project, uh, but the markets really want the next quarterly result. How do you advise people in in, in your sort of elevator pitch on the two? Well, I mean, you know, I, I've got a lot of. Um, I know a lot of organizations who are quoted and in fact I used to be an equity analyst so I was I was the 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 problem as it were here's what I always say you have to give them something so th there has to be uh, some some goodies that are essentially freebies that you just give away easy things that you knew that you could do fat that you can cut that doesn't actually take fundamental change um, and and essentially they really are the traditional quick wins scope those, work on them, deliver them to the market, essentially to buy you time to do the fundamental change that requires the J-curve. So I think they can be pacified, but that requires an active, um, you know, you have to deliberately set out to do that, knowing that it's important. Great, thank you. That's uh, useful advice for us all, I think, whether we're in the public markets or whatever stakeholders would like us to yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's got a boss, right? Yes, we all have a boss. And on that note, I'm, sadly, we're out of time. Um, I would just like to thank you, Elspeth, uh, for spending this time with us and thank everyone who is uh, tuned in today with us live or who is watching uh, the recording. We hope you, that you're finding uh, this series continues to be useful for you and we'll have another uh, in, in two weeks' time. I think we have maybe have a closing oh. slide that uh, just tells you a little bit about uh, the next webinar. Uh, with that... I would uh, very much like to say thank you once again, Elspeth. Thank Pleasure. you to the MIT Sloan Executive Education team who have produced this event for us. Thank you all for joining us, and I'll see you all in a couple of weeks.